dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. All of us need times where we can take a break and let our spirits be renewed. In this very special series on a retreat with King David, I lead business professionals through a time of reflection on their own life as leaders in the light of the story of King David. God's incredible working in David's life presents a paradigm to help us understand the challenges and the grace of our own. Hi, everybody. I'm just so honored to be on retreat with you, to be able to have this chance for us to take a step back and let God renew us. If we don't let God speak his word to us in ways that are new, it's no wonder that we get bored or feel that we're, we're out of touch. I mean, our lives are constantly being drained by so many things. You guys are amazing. I mean, you go from one strategic meeting into one difficult conversation into a new job hire into being asked for advice on all kinds of different things that go on and it can be exhausting. It can be exhausting. You, you finish one project and then they say, okay, that was the end of that one. Now on to the next one. And you kind of ask yourself, will there ever be an end to these projects, right? Like, you know, it's a good thing that we love to work, right? Because if we didn't love to work, we'd all be burned out by now. But even if you love the work, there comes a time where you say, I just had enough and I really need a break. And when those moments come, it's always important to go back to the real place where we can find refreshment, a place that where the greatness that we engage every day can be sharpened. You see, it's like what the Stephen Covey talked about when he talked about how one of the rules of, of great leadership is that great leaders will take the time to go out and sharpen the saw, right? So you can try to cut down a tree, but if you don't try to sharpen the saw, eventually you're, you're less effective, right? And so when we do a retreat in spirituality, I want you to realize you are sharpening the saw here for the real leadership that you exert every single day in your professions. Every single day in your businesses, you are called to give a greatness that comes from God to this world. You're called to shine. He wouldn't have put you in a spot of leadership if he didn't ask you from that spot to make an impact in this world in his name, to shine his light, to be his hands and his feet. Right? And that's exactly what you've done. You've stepped forward and you said yes. And so you need to resharpen your saw, your, your saw in a way that allows that voice of Jesus who first called you to leave everything behind and follow him as his disciples to resound in your hearts again. And I'm, I'm going to do that with King David. I want us to look at the life of David, but in a way that's deep and that gives you a real sense of rest. I want to lead you on a retreat here in the footsteps of that great king. So let's start with a prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to come with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, you see us here with heads bowed and with hearts open, ready to hear and welcome your word that's power to change us. And we ask you, God, to set our hearts on fire, to inspire us, to let us dare great things for you, and to renew us deep within as only you can, through the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so let's look at King David's in life in a new way. I want you to look at King David's life as if it was a, a map that showed you the landmarks of your own. 
And that's, that's really hard for us because you're going to say, well, King David was so much different than me. I just live in America. I do my little thing. I just have my job, my family, my little quiet life. And King David was one of the greatest men of all history. And so he's so much different from me. But when you do that, you don't allow the word of God to be spoken to you as if it was about you. And in fact, it is. The word of God is always about us, about each one of us. In our growth, our, our struggles, our triumphs, our great call that is in Jesus Christ and in God, it, it's written for us there in the lives of these saints. So let's plunge in together, huh? Let's take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is when, of course, Samuel goes and summons the sons of Jesse to be in front of him so that he can anoint them. And we know that they all stand in front of him and none of them are the ones that God has called. Then you get to verse 11 and it says, Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. It's an incredible moment, right? Because David's right in front of all of his brothers. He's right in front of everyone who knows him and who looks upon his outside and sees that he is of loathsome stature who puts him out into the field to tend the sheep when the rest of them are doing things that are much more important in the father's business. But God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the inside. And David has to therefore learn to look at himself, not from the outside, but as God looks at him. This is a whole transvert. This is the conversion that allows you to receive the grace of God in your hearts. I think a lot of business people struggle. A lot of leaders just struggle to really receive the love of God for them. We plunge ourselves into activities because it's easier to keep filling that void with things that we do. And, and if I just keep busy enough, I can distract myself from the fact that sometimes I don't even know if I'm really loved. And when the bad times come, that gets uncovered. You know, the number of great actors or actresses or or songsmiths who've killed themselves. At the end of an amazing career, they've won Oscars, and yet, and yet they, when it's all uncovered, they're running away from anything that they really are because they don't really believe in what's on the inside. I ask myself this all the time. How, how is it that such successful people could be failures when it comes to spirituality? I mean, just really not connect with their faith. Some of you out there right now, you're, you're sitting there saying, that's me. I'm doing things. I go to church even. But like in my heart, I don't know if he loves me. And that's where your faith begins. It begins just like when David allowed the words of the prophet and the anointing that he received by the prophet to guide his heart. And if you were to allow the baptism you received at the hands of the priest and the words of encouragement that you received from the voices of your priests in your homilies to guide your life instead of the negativity and the despair and the anger that hits you from every other voice, you would be like David. God does not create people to, make, to condemn them. He doesn't make junk and he doesn't allow people to live lives that are worthless when they're trying to follow him. He's inside of you. He's so close to you that you can't even see him. It doesn't matter whether or not you feel loved. You know you are loved every time you look at that cross and you remembered that God died for you and that he sent his son for you and that he sent his son in the flesh to redeem you, that you are priceless in his eyes. If you believe that, then you start to follow King David. David had to believe. He had to take that step and allow himself to be anointed in front of all of his peers to accept that there was a love that God had for him that he had that was totally unique. And God has that love for you and for your spouse and your children in a way that's totally unique. Believe in that. Let that be the starting point of the rest of your Christian life. 
Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. And so we turn then to chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David suddenly comes to his his rise here in Israel by facing Goliath. You know, and there's a lot to be said about this passage. Uh, and the very first is that, you know, the, how in the world did David have enough courage to face Goliath when no one else in Israel did? I mean, Goliath was an enormous fellow and his weaponry was incredibly intimidating. I mean, when you, when you look at this, it's, it go to 1 Samuel 17, verse 36 David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Meaning that Goliath was enough to make an entire army pause, right? King, the king, King Saul paused. All of his brethren paused. Everyone said no one can defeat this Goliath. He would come down on a daily, you know, daily occasion he would come and he would curse God and he would challenge them to fight, right? It, it says right here, right? His, he had a coat of 5,000 shekels of bronze, a bronze armor on his legs, a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The sa- shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, right? And then he's got a shield bearer in front of him just holding the shield. I mean, this is a terrifying thing. It really, it takes a very special person to resist the call to fear. And I, when, I, when I look at the lives that we're called to live as leaders, you know, we're called to face the fears that everybody else hides from. Isn't that something? It's so much easier just to say, I'm, ter- I'm a terrible teacher. I can't teach. And so like, I'm just going to be afraid of teaching. So I'm just going to like go home. The kids, who's going to be, who's going to keep the kids at bay during the class? Who's going to communicate to them today? Who's going to face the problems that they have, right? Like, I, it's not me. There's like a Goliath that rises in front of every, every teacher. Every single day, they've got to go in there and slay that Goliath. And it's called the classroom of 35 teenagers at 2.40 in the afternoon when the air conditioning is broken and the classroom is 90 degrees, right? Like that is an, they can just say that's impossible. Or the Goliath that rises in front of us. You know, we take a look at the healthcare system, the diseases that are out there. Then you throw a pandemic on top of it and, you could just take a look at, you know, the, the, can I really confront this employee and fire them? If I, if I fire them, what will happen? Right? The, the obstacles just rise in front of us all the time. And it takes a leader to step forward and say, for the sake of everyone else who gets to quit, I won't. I know it would be easier if I just ran from this fear. And it would be easier if I didn't even try to parent the kids, right? Just give them the iPhone, give it to them when they want, let them do what they want because it's so hard to wrestle with the will of a child whom I love so much, right? So we just don't do it. We, we, we put things off. And every time we do that, we fail in leadership. We're like the army of Israel that's looking at a Goliath and letting Goliath rip the heart and soul out of our army because the leaders are afraid of him. And in that same circumstance walks David. And David says, let not your heart fail because of this man. Isn't that amazing? What an awesome line. He says, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And he said, what got into David to make him want to rise? Boy, I wish whatever got into him would get into you. <laughs> I wish whatever got into him would get into his church, Right? It would be amazing if instead of us saying, you know what, it's going to be really hard. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of things to, that'll be hurt, you know, like, and therefore we're all going to go back into our comfort. What if we said, you know what, we weren't made for comfort. We were made for greatness. And greatness is sometimes claimed in difficult circumstances and through pain. But you know what? That's what leaders do. They don't let their people be overcome by mediocrity. They inspire their people to enter the field of battle and do what it takes to win the glorious crown for which they're made. Where did David get this courage? Where did this spirit come from? Remember, it came from the fact that he was anointed by God. 
That each one of you was anointed by God at your baptism. You were anointed by God at your confirmation. The whole Catholic Church exists as this big anointing by God. His grace is upon this room. His spirit courses through your veins. He is the soul of your soul. Why are you afraid? What voice of what giant have you allowed to boast in your field of battle while you cower behind the various forms that you protect yourself with? Since everybody else is, is not fighting that battle, I won't fight it either, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, that's fine. You're about to lose to the Philistines. Well, the time has come for us to no longer lose the Philistines. What does it take? It takes men and women who say, I am loved by God, and the one who has loved me will not leave me. Bring on the battle. I was not made to cower in fear in front of any Goliath, whatever the size might be. There is no one who is bigger than God. And we see what happens here when David, this is uh, verse 41. And, and so the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Then the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Notice the boasting here of Goliath that he doesn't realize his own downfall. Yeah, well, his downfall is written already in the will of God because the downfall of that boast is not the fact that the enemy boasts that makes us more afraid. David doesn't listen to the voice of the enemy. He listens to the spirit of God inside of his heart. And I want to challenge you here because the reason why a lot of you fail in your leadership is because you fail to, to face your fears. And you fail to face your fears because, frankly, fears are fearsome. <laughs> fears make us afraid. Only when you listen to them. Maybe it's time for you to stop listening to that voice of that fear. You've been listening to it so long that you're actually doing exactly what your fear is telling you to do. Your fear is ruling your life instead of your faith. Right? Why, why would you let fear rule your life instead of faith? You know, th think about it. Why would you allow your, 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 your fear of failure, your fear of being called a hypocrite, your fear of mercy, your fear of whatever to be stronger than the fight for victory inside of you? Sometimes victory requires great courage and there's no other way to do it. Sometimes victory belongs only to the courageous. And the great courage is exactly what David shows us. He says this, he says, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And so and then he goes forward and he strikes the Philistine in the forehead and the Philistine falls to the ground and dies. Being called and being chosen by God, it means being called and being chosen to enter into the battle with the courage of the warrior God made you to be. And David shows us that his strength in battle comes from his conviction that God has not abandoned him. And my friends, he hasn't abandoned you either. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. You know, perhaps nowhere else in, in, in David's story do we see God's love for him better than when David actually fails. And I think that that's just an amazing scene, right? And we're going to have occasion to talk about this at length when we, when we pray together through the passages of David's failure. What I want to focus on with you now, though, isn't his failure, but the response of gratitude in his heart. You see, so we all know what happens to David. David and Bathsheba, he sees Bathsheba bathing, he takes Bathsheba as if Bathsheba was his wife, and in fact, Bathsheba's not. Bathsheba becomes pregnant. David hides, tries to hide it with Uriah. Uriah refuses to go for, for it, and so ends up, David puts Uriah into battle 
withdraws the army and the husband of the wife that David took in infidelity, David puts to the death in the battlefield. And so he tries to cover up his crime by another. It's a really dastardly deed and it shows us just how far David could fall. And I think it's an amazingly powerful scene for us because sometimes we feel like we've fallen so far no one could even believe it and that there's no redemption for us. There's, we are beyond God's mercy. If, we, if anyone knew the things that we'd done in our life, they would never give us a second chance. And so we try to hide it too. Sometimes we hide it just behind mediocrity. We hide it behind not even trying anymore. Almost like, because I don't want to be a hypocrite, I won't even try. I don't want people to realize that I am in fact bad, so I'll just stay mediocre. I'll just hide. I won't go forward and do anything because I feel like I've been discounted by my past. One of the most beautiful gifts God gives David is to not let him hide. He calls the prophet Nathan to him and Nathan the prophet corrects King David right to his face and King David responds with repentance. We find it in 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now what most of us would expect to happen at that moment is that then lightning comes out of the sky and just knocks David down to the ground and David is, disappears in some sort of divine wrath. And if that didn't happen, then most of us would then say, well, basically David is done. I mean, he's, he's uncovered that he's not worthy of being king. He's a terrible leader because of that and his life is ruined and he should just go and breed golden retrievers on some nice farm in North Carolina, right? Like, you're just done and put out to pasture after something like this. That's not how God works. Look at the next line with me. This is 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Now, what if, you were to, what if you were to get that word? What if you were to go to confession? And some of you haven't been to confession in 10, 15 years. I know, I know, and, and I know that you know, right? Now, I, I want to challenge you. If you haven't been to confession in over a year, this is, why are you putting off that great moment? Do you think that you haven't sinned? You know, I can guarantee you, you have. I mean, all you have to do is go to the priest and say, Father, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> it's really great because we priests, it doesn't even, doesn't even matter if we can read your souls or not because like we can't, you know. But we can tell you what you did. I can tell you right now, we it. I can feel it in the room. You were angry. Yes, and you said bad words. You know, if you haven't said a bad word in this past year, like, I mean, wow. I'll tell you something else. And I got a whole list of suggestions for you in confession. Guys, the point is all of us have sinned. The Bible actually has a spot where it says, a good man sins seven times every day. Seven times a day, a good man falls in Proverbs. Now think about that. So, so the problem isn't that we don't have sins. The problem is that we don't want to confess them. You know, and I want to just put, say, t tell you, I don't think David wanted to go to confession either. But God sent Nathan the priest in order to accuse him of his sin. And David repented to God in front of Nathan the prophet. So that he could there in his presence receive the same act of forgiveness. God has not held your sin against you. You shall not die. What an amazing thing. And, and David has to believe. He gets to believe that God loves him despite his sinfulness. You know, some of you come on this retreat and you're carrying the burden of failed parenting or failed grandfathering or families that just didn't turn out the way that you thought that they would. You try to do everything right and they just, everything turned out differently. And you come in with this kind of heavy burden because, I mean, next, your next step is like you might not see the next generation. You know, you only got the generations you can see and you're saying to yourself, what did I do wrong? Where did I get it, not get it right? And that kind of anxiety just eats at your heart, right? Or you look at your business and you're saying, I'm not running it the right way. Why isn't it going better? 
Or, or maybe it's going fine, but you kind of feel guilty saying, why is, it, why is it so easy for me? What am I supposed to do with my life? I don't know what it is that you've got inside that's weighing you down, but we can't let it. There's something else inside of our life that's bigger than that. It's the mercy of God for you. David gets up again because his calling is not just when he's a little shepherd boy and God thinks the world of him so anoints him with all of his strength like he anointed you when you started your business and got your family going and you, and, and you got out there and you were daring great things, you know, and God was with you in the beginnings and everything was fresh like the springtime and there were no mistakes and there were no regrets. Remember those days, you know? And then we look back and now we get to a certain stage in our lives and we look back like I actually have regrets, you know? I got things I would rather have done differently. Do you think that God's choice for you has failed or his love for you has run out? Then read with me 2 Samuel 12, verse 14. The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. I think it's the mark of courageous leadership to rise up again, not because of your strength, your perfection, but because of his mercy. God wants David to keep serving him despite his failures. In fact, God wants him to now change from serving him because of his strength to serving him because of his mercy, to letting God's love for him be the base of his life. He's called and he's chosen in the good times and in the bad, and he's chosen to lead. And so are you. Don't let anything keep you back when God is pushing you forward. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.